Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Cat's Corner. I'm kind of excited uh, for this one because I'm very excited about today's guest. He is the gold standard for sports journalists. He is Ken Rosenthal of The Athletic and Fox. Ken, I appreciate you coming on to talk a little baseball today. Jim, thank you. I don't know about the gold standard, but I appreciate the kind words. You are the gold standard. I think everyone would recognize it. So we wanted to bring you on and talk uh, Cardinals baseball, get your opinions on some of the stuff going on with the Redbirds. But the first thing I wanted to ask you about is the uniform situation. I wanted the real story. So I was at spring training a little while ago, and I will say that I saw those uniforms. I didn't really get to see the see-through aspect of the of the pant but what i saw was a jersey that looked like it was designed to be economically efficient or perhaps a less expensive option because it didn't look great what's the real story there i don't know what the real story is jim it's kind of absurd if you ask me that this has all happened obviously there are certain players led by miles michaelis i should say he was the first one really to point this out, who are unhappy. And when you have a group of players who are unhappy and it seems to be a somewhat sizable group, it seems to me that they have a point. So the two issues are the pants, obviously the see-through aspect of them, and as you said, the jerseys, which look to some amateurish. And my biggest problem is the smaller lettering on the jerseys, on the backs of the jerseys. Here is a sport that needs to market its players better, and yet it's making them harder to identify for fans who are sitting in the stands, even on television. So I don't understand that aspect of it. In my opinion, the league should listen to the players and work with Nike and Fanatics to get this straight before opening day. This should not be like splitting an atom here. This should be something that's pretty solvable, at least in my mind. I'm not a fashion expert, but... It's kind of amazing that this is the biggest story of the spring, and it is. It's crazy. I I hate to admit this, but a group of uh, folks at the office ordered some of the jerseys, the knockoff ones from China, and they look to be better quality. So MLB has the power to do something. All right, let's talk Cardinals baseball. So it's it's not a mystery. In the offseason, the Cardinals' top priority, three starters, they did that early, right? They get Gibson, they get Gray, and they get Lance Lynn. The question is, and those guys are, you know, they're they're veterans. They're guys who are not at the beginning of their careers. Did the Cardinals do enough for that rotation to get them to where they want to be? I'm not sure, Jim. And my instinct is to say no, that really those three guys are fine. But I would have liked to have seen them get a top of the rotation guy a pure top of the rotation guy. You could argue Sonny Gray is that. He certainly had a great year last year. But perfect world, perfect world. Maybe Montgomery, who's not necessarily top of the rotation, but someone who's in his prime, at least. That's my concern here. These are older guys. They are pitchers who throw a lot of innings. That's good. They have a track record of doing that. At least Gibson and Lynn do, for sure. But I don't know that it's enough. And I know they have some kids coming, all organizations do, but... For an organization that is looking to turn around what was a miserable year last year, is that enough? I don't know if that's enough, to be perfectly honest. The guy that I find intriguing is Lance Lynn. He's going to be 37 in May, I think. Gave up an awful lot of home runs last year. But I think a part of it is where he was pitching and what his motivation was. I'm not trying to get inside Lance Lynn's brain. But I do know this from experience. When Lance Lynn is ticked off, he's probably going to be better, and it seems like he knows he has something to prove. He definitely knows that. Now, whether he can change things around, that remains to be seen. Because, Jim, let's face it, I'm sure at, say, the All-Star break last year, he was ticked off, right? He wasn't happy with how he was pitching, and yet it didn't really change. So I'm a Lance Lynn fan. I've watched him for years like you have and know that he is – absolute gamer someone you want on your team but is he beginning the downward slope of his career is he in the downward slope of his career and can he get back to being say a 180 inning four to four and a half era guy that remains to be seen it's something we have to see him do 
before we fully buy into Lance Lynn as a really viable guy at the top of the rotation again. You also look at the rotation depth. And to be honest, I mean, you know this, like even when you think you have seven starters, at some point you're going to be down to four, maybe three. And usually it starts cropping up at spring training. So their depth right now is Zach Thompson and Matthew Libertor, two guys who actually I think could have uh, big roles in the bullpen if the, if the rotation's healthy. Are they deep enough with that rotation? You mentioned they do have some young guys, probably aren't quite ready yet. You're right, Jim. You're never deep enough. And the one thing about them is that, like all teams, if things go awry, if you do have some starters injured, there is the trade deadline, and there is the possibility of getting other pitchers. Right now, actually, there are some free agents available, and who knows? Maybe some of them will linger into the season. And I'm not talking about Snell and Montgomery. I'm talking about Lorenzen and Lauer and Mike Clevenger. These guys are competent major league pitchers, and yet they're still looking for work. So... There will be options available. The problem with the deadline is you're competing with every other team, and it becomes problematic. They do have a good system. They do have the ability to make trades, but that is not something that it seems to me they want to do. So this is going to play out, and we'll see how it plays out. What's interesting to me, Jim, is they knew this was the problem, right? We all knew this was the problem, and they chose to address the problem in this fashion. Now, maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't, but it's kind of a big bet that they've placed on older inning logging starting pitchers. Now, the other side of the coin is putting all your eggs in a young guy's basket. I think, I think the guy's basket is great and Mason win. Like, I know he had 170 last year. What I saw was an athlete, unlike we've seen at shortstop in St. Louis since Ozzy. And if you know his background, he always starts slow at every level then comes on like gangbusters. But for the Cardinals, who just picked up Crawford as a, as a backup, and Tommy Edmond having you know wrist issues where his timetable for return is still kind of up in the air, they need Mason Wynn to have a good spring. So my question to you is, are you as high on Mason Wynn as I am? Because I think this guy is going to be really, really good, and he'll be good starting this year. I am high on him, and... Just taking a step back, Jim, when you're the Cardinals or any team, no matter how big your payroll is, when you develop a prospect like Mason Wynn or Jordan Walker or any of the other recent hitters that have reached the major leagues, Nolan Gorman, at some point you have to play these guys. You have to see what you have. And for me, with Mason Wynn, it's not simply that. It's you want to play him. He has, like you said, athletic ability. He has the ability to do some things offensively, too. And you're right. He has started slowly at different levels, and that should not be a major concern. Yes, they needed Crawford simply to have some insurance there and maybe to give Mason Wynn some pointers. That's part of the appeal of Crawford. But I'm with you on him. They need to be playing him, and I would expect, because of his pedigree, because of what he has already accomplished in the minors, that he is going to succeed. The signing of Crawford, to me, was kind of a no brainer, even though it makes their bench very left-hand eccentric. Um, but you need a guy who you know can play some defense. They always talk about veteran experience. And to me, kind of Crawford is exactly what they needed in that spot. Yeah, I would agree. And I do believe he'll have a beneficial effect on Wynn. He has accepted at this stage of his career where he is on the age spectrum and the playing spectrum. He took the job with St. Louis knowing that he wasn't going to be the starting shortstop. And remember, too, he was spurned by the only team he's ever played for, the San Francisco Giants. And I expect that would motivate him quite a bit because he did want to be back there. But they moved in a different direction. Actually, I'm not even sure the direction they're moving is because they don't really have answers in shortstop. But they moved on from him. So Brandon Crawford, I'm not expecting him to go hit 300 over 400 plays. But coming off the bench, doing some things, spelling Mason win on occasion, serving as protection, he can do all that, I believe. And it's not a pivotal sign or by any stretch of the imagination, but it should be a sign that helps them. So when you talk about Mason Wynn, you have to also talk about Jordan Walker because they're buddies. They're the future of the Cardinals. I think that's a really good thing because I think they're both going to be really, really good. 
I know from talking to Walker, he put in a ton of work in the offseason to finally become an outfielder. He had on-the-job training last season. He's put in the work in the offseason to be better. And I think offensively, I think he might have just been scratching the surface of what he can be. What are your thoughts on what Jordan Walker will be in the future? Similar to Mason Wynn, not the similar kind of projection. They're different players, of course, different kinds of hitters. But I expect him to succeed. And you're right. He had a difficult transition last year. Started in the majors, sent him down, the whole thing that happened. He is not an experienced outfielder. He has worked at it, as you've said. These kinds of guys, they're great athletes. They're pedigree prospects. They tend to figure it out. Once in a while, of course, they don't turn out to be what you expected. Once in a while, they turn out to be busts. But I don't expect that either of these kids will be busts. And when you say they're the Cardinals' future, that's kind of cool to hear it like that. And in my view, they've got a good future, and they're in good hands with those two kids. Yeah, and I, I just think they're both really good kids, too, who work at it, which is important, too. So those guys are very important pieces, but I, I think you'd agree the mainstays for the Cardinals are the guys at the corner. Nolan Arenado wasn't happy with the season he had. Paul Goldschmidt wasn't happy with the season he had last year. But let's be honest, it's not like they're getting any younger. So what do you expect from those two guys because as far as I'm concerned, you're going to need those guys to be Arenado and Goldsmith for the Cardinals to get to the postseason and, and maybe have a good showing. There's no question about that. And because they are a year older and Goldsmith in particular is getting to an age where you start to wonder, you can't be certain of what they're going to give you. Arenado, I expect, will have a better year than last year. Goldschmidt had an amazing year in 22. I don't know that he could have ever repeated that. But he is someone that works as hard as any player and is as diligent as any player. And if it's there to be figured out, he's going to figure it out. I do have questions about this. And what's interesting to me here, Jim, the Cardinals have questions on Goldschmidt because otherwise they would have signed him to an extension already. He goes into his free agent year. I believe he's age 37. And they want to pick it. They want to see how the team fares, of course, but they want to see him and see where he is maybe a month or two into the season before they make that decision. And I would expect that fans should be in the same kind of wait-and-see mode. Nothing against Paul Goldschmidt. He's one of the great players of our time. But at the same time, it's a prove-it game. It's a harsh game, and players have to, every year, reestablish who they are. And I believe that Goldschmidt will do his absolute best to do that. But whether age is catching up with him, that remains to be seen. From what you saw with his at-bats last year, did you see any telltale signs that maybe age was catching up with him? I did. So I guess I would ask you, you you saw them every day. Did you see signs? Because I really didn't pick up on that. So you know what I saw? I saw a bunch of guys who have high expectations when a season is going south and Lo and behold, they're down 5-1 again. Maybe kind of expanding the zone to try to make too much happen. I don't know if I would chalk that up necessarily to, oh, you know, see, he's getting older. As to some of the frustration that crept in last year, because it was a disastrous season. I would tend to agree with that. And Arnato in particular is a very emotional player. Goldschmidt is not. Goldschmidt is very even field. Arnato is a guy who is hard on himself who will press at times, he would tell you this. And in the situation they were in, he was surely frustrated and probably, as I said, pressing. So this requires then the theory that we have here, Jim, for the team to get off to a good start and play well. Because if they don't get off to a good start and play well, we're looking at the same scenario again. If that is indeed the reason they struggled, then frankly, this is as good a reason as any that I've heard. So like any team, all 30, there are all these fascinating questions. There are no sure things in this game ever. And every year, you, me, and everyone else who covers it get surprised by things that happen. So I'm eager to see how this all plays out for them because last year was, as they've said, pretty much to a man, a huge disappointment. And they've got a manager now who has to produce. They've got a team that has to produce. And even a president of baseball operations who's reputation to some extent is on the line here. It's all going to play out. We'll just have to see what happens. 
So you bring up Ali Marmol, who knows the pressure's on him. He's a wonderful guy. I think despite what you might have read, like the players love playing for Ali, okay? But he knows that was an awful season. He's the manager. He has to be better. They have to be better. You also factor in they start in Los Angeles against the Stack Dodgers team. Early part of the schedule is tough. Do you think that he's in the hot seat right now? As you said, Jim, he has to produce. They have to win. And he's gone through some things now as a manager. He should be more experienced, obviously. He should have a better feel for certain situations than maybe he had before. When a guy starts off in that job, it's not easy. And it's funny because of guys I covered early in my career in Baltimore, I have kind of this built-in bias against first-time managers, which is completely unfair because you have to start somewhere. But it does sometimes take a bit. And maybe Ali Marmol has learned some things that will serve him well in this season and in the future. But, yeah, he's on the hot seat simply because if it doesn't go well, people are going to raise that question, and that's the definition of hot seat. So let's talk about John Mazalock, who I think has kind of hinted that once his contract's up, I think after next season, um, he might be interested in doing something. He's not sure. Um, but he told me, yeah, I feel the pressure too. Do you think there's pressure on Mo? I don't know that there's pressure on him from above. Honestly, if ownership was looking to make a change, they probably would have made it after last season, right? So it seems from that perspective, he's fine. But is there external pressure? Is there pressure from the fan base? Pressure from perhaps the media? Pressure in general? Yes, absolutely. There was pressure on all 30 heads of baseball operations. And when you're coming off a year like the year they had, and when you've made the choices that they've made in the offseason, yes, there is definitely pressure. And Mo has been pretty open about that and pretty forthcoming and pretty understanding of what's going on in terms of perception, in terms of what people think. And he knows that this is a time where they've got to take another step forward. It's really true of everyone in the organization. We've gone through this, right? The prospects, Wynn and Walker. The veterans, Goldschmidt and Arnado, Ali Marmel, Mo. This is a big year for everyone, and more so maybe than in the past. Because if you look at going into last year, we all expected they'd be the Cardinals, they'd be good, no problem. Well, it didn't happen, and that's why the stakes are a little bit higher now. Heim Bloom was brought in for outside perspective, and he's in the shadows now. He doesn't want to be quoted by anyone. He just wants to do his thing which is advised so what is his role all about and tell us about the heim bloom factor if you could i don't know necessarily what his role is exactly but he and mo can answer he is a special assistant and generally speaking what those people do is advise and point out different areas in the organization that they see maybe would need improvement i thought heim bloom in boston was okay and he had some issues at the deadline where he was maybe too deliberate and maybe he was trying to please too many masters at once. The ownership, in my mind, brought him in to do what he did, to cut payroll, to make hard decisions on rookie bets, start with him, and to build a better farm system for the future. Really, all of that happened. And what changed was the ownership come last July said, you know what? We sort of want to win. Let's go. And it was a little bit of a shift in direction that I don't know that Heimblum expected or was prepared to deal with or even understood was going on at the time because it seemed that there were mixed messages going on. There are still mixed messages with that organization. They claim they want to win, and they're not doing a whole lot to show that they want to win. And in some ways, the job Craig Preslow has done has been very similar to what Heimblum was doing. So... Long story short, Jim, I believe he's a good baseball man in the sense that he has a good feel for different aspects of the game, and I believe he will prove helpful to that organization. So I wanted to get your input on this. When a, when a season goes terribly wrong, like it did for the Cardinals last year, you point to all these different things, oh, th th this is why, this is why. Probably the starting rotation faltered early, ate up the bullpen, then the whole snowball went downhill. So they bring in Matt Carpenter because they need leadership. That's what that's what they told us, all right? Matt Carpenter 
needs leadership. Some of the other guys said they kind of need uh, a little help on that front. Was that a big issue for the Cardinals last year, a lack of leadership as far as you know? wasn't a big issue the year before with essentially the same group. Now, it always helps to have that kind of presence in the clubhouse. Albert gave it to him when they were there. Yadier was that guy for years. But I don't know that leadership was the issue last year. Performance was the issue last year. And I don't know also that Matt Carpenter, in a limited role, is going to be much of a leader. That's not what a guy on the bench normally does. Does a veteran in the clubhouse help in certain ways, as Brandon Crawford is expected to do? Yes. And certainly this is a team that, for a time, it seemed was rudderless without Yachty. The transition to Contreras did not go smoothly. But Goldschmidt, in his way, is a leader. It's a lead-by-example kind of thing. And then Arnado, in his own way, is a leader, too. So I don't know that it's a huge issue, but... <clears throat> Winning solves all of this stuff, all of it, all the time. You mentioned Wilson Contreras, a guy who went through some things last year, had a very good year at the plate, seemed to get more confident as the season went along. Having gone through that and kind of won over his teammates and fans with the fire that he brings, how much easier do you think this season will be for a guy like that, having gone through the first season as a Cardinal? It could be easier, and the first year for a free agent, is often difficult, a high money free agent, because there are expectations that weren't on that player before. He's in a new city. There's often that transition. Now, this guy was replacing the outstanding defensive catcher of our time, Yadier Molina. And he does not have a great defensive reputation, and he caused some problems early, which in my mind were entirely predictable. And I know he had a great interview with the Cardinals, and I know Wilson Contreras. He's a charming guy, but he is, for the most part, an offensive player. Now, he has worked at the defense. I believe he wants to get better at the defense. That's sincere. But that wasn't who he is or was. And from that perspective, I thought it was a curious signing from the very beginning. You're replacing the all-time great defensive catcher with a guy whose reputation for that is not that great. He got better as the year went on. The whole thing seemed to get better, and he certainly can hit. And he certainly is a guy, talk about leadership, he gives them an emotional center. And it can be good and bad, the emotions, obviously, but he cares an awful lot. And he's someone who burns to win. So, yes, it should be easier in year two. I definitely would expect that. Last thing before we let you go. Terrible year for the Cardinals last year. I think most people would say they're going to be better. In Ken Rosenthal's opinion, how much better will the Cardinals be than last season? I'm not sure, Jim. And <laughs> the Cubs are okay. The Reds, in my mind, are the dark horse to win this thing. And I think the Brewers are going to be better than people think. The Pirates may be slightly improved. I don't know that they're going to be a threat to anyone. The Cardinals are a bit of a wild card here because they certainly have, on paper, the ability to win this division. I thought even as late as May last year, they were going to run away because they were the Cardinals. So the question is, do they become the Cardinals again? And I don't know. <laughs> That's <laughs> beauty of the game, right? I, I just can't predict. I'm always terrible at predictions anyway. So it seems to me, yes, they should be better. I, that's a reasonable expectation. How much better is the question? Our guest has been the great Ken Rosenthal. Ken, I appreciate you spending a little time with us and talking Cardinals baseball. Thanks very much, Jim. Appreciate it. That's going to do it for this edition of the Cats Corner. On the way out, hit the like and subscribe button. We'll see you next time.